Remind me, so let me hit record because someone forgot. I don't know who it was, but a couple webinars ago to hit record. So, uh, and she's telling me, uh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Juliet. Um, for those of you that don't know, Juliet is the director of our programs at the Fort Bend Chamber. I want to welcome you to our Tuesday, Thursday uh, webinars uh, done through the Business and Professional Division of the Fort Bend Chamber of Commerce. My name is Kevin Riles. Uh, I am the Business and Professional Division uh, chairperson for this year. Uh, I'm a small business owner, just like most of you out there. I'm a commercial real estate broker uh, with offices in Missouri City and Sugar Land. And it's my pleasure to serve as your business and professional division chair this week. Uh, well, this year, I should say. What we have done in the past in a quote unquote normal uh, world is that we usually do once a month lunch and learn seminars on just various tools and topics that uh, are helpful to our constituents as far as business owners and the residents of Fort Bend. However, in this new quarantine world, we have pivoted to do uh, bi-weekly uh, seminars and webinars on topics that we think will help you throughout this pandemic. So we've done everything, uh, and you can go back to the website if you want to check some of these things out. We've done two sessions on the CARES Act. So if you have questions about the CARES Act, those are out there. We've done sessions on how to effectively work from home uh, with some folks that have been doing it for a long time and with technology tools, uh, how to market your business and Facebook uh, during this time. We have a lot of extra time, so you know some new ways to market. But today, we have two awesome, awesome experts uh, in basically how do I work safe uh, during this uh, pandemic? How do I uh, uh, work safe during this uh, pandemic. And so um, we, uh, the people at the chamber, which again, Carrie, Juliet, Paige, Ryan, Stacy, uh, I was going to make sure I get all, all everyone, don't leave anybody out, um, put these together and they just allowed me to come in, sit and learn at the same time. So my role in this today is really just to kind of uh, be a representation of you guys out there that are, are listening. So before we get started, um, I want to uh, do two things. One is to remind you of how you uh, would ask a question. Uh, we like for this to be interactive. We're going to do this today um, more so as a conversation uh, and not as much as uh, just a lecture. Uh, so we want you to be able to participate uh, and let us know what um, you know your questions are uh, as far as uh, uh, what we're doing today. Uh, and then secondly, uh, so how you how you would go about uh, letting us know what your questions are, are uh, you can put them in the chat to your right-hand side, uh, and uh, you can put them in the chat in the right-hand side, or uh, you can raise your hand at the very bottom, for those of you that are on the app, the very bottom there's a raise hand button uh, that you can click to raise your hand if you wanna ask a verbal question. Uh, and again, uh, the other third way is there's a Q&A button at the very bottom as well uh, that if you want to ask a question, um, you can do that. So three ways. One, you can put them in the chat. Second, you can raise your hand and I can call on you. Uh, and third, uh, the Q&A feature uh, uh, will allow us to be able to uh, see your questions and answer them uh, on, uh, on Q. And so what we plan to cover today just in general uh, are, are basically uh, three questions. Uh, one, uh, how will you handle the uh, public interaction during this pandemic time? How to prepare for a safe working environment? And then are you workforce uh, ready? So those are our general questions. I'm sure other things will come up. Uh, but today I'm pleased uh, to uh, introduce two people to you. Uh, first is uh, Mike Dobert or Michael Dobert uh, to be formal who is president and owner, uh, principal of HR in Alignment, uh, the best, if I must say so myself, HR consultant that I know. I mean, you know, and I know millions of them. Uh, so he is the, the best. I got to know Mike during the uh, leadership uh, process or leadership uh, program we have at the, the chamber. Shout out to leadership, by the way. If you're interested, let me know. It's a very good program. Uh, uh, and and uh, so we are very pleased to have uh, have uh, Mikey? Did I miss any 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 accolades, Mike? I just want to make sure. No, you're fine. I'm Mike. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm simple. <laughs> uh, and Thank then, you. and and then I would say, um, uh, and his name just escaped me. Not not the our speaker today. Uh, the there's one A and then there's one A plus in fire chiefs in the area. Uh, and so since I went through leadership with with one fire chief of Stafford, 
uh, then I, I can't say you're the best one I know, but you're just as good uh, uh, <laughs> uh, in, in the uh, Fort Bend. So we appreciate you joining us as well. So you went with Larry? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was going through with Larry. I know you have comments because Larry's a different type of dude. So <laughs> he's like, uh, don't compare me. Uh, Larry's, uh, but, Larry's no. a good friend. No, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. So we appreciate you uh, guys uh, starting. So I guess I'll start off. Uh, Mike, you want to take it from there? Well, I think Doug's going to start off and talk okay. a little bit about public interaction and sure. um, safe work environment, and then I'll catch on the back end of that and finish up the last point. Sure. So I'll turn it over to Chief Doug. All right. Yeah, so when when this first came across, uh, we were trying to figure out how what the city's role in, in, in a uh, presentation like this might be. And it started in HR and it moved to risk and then it kind of came to fire. And at the end of the day, the fire department, we're really a service industry. Um, we're in the people business. And, and so this hit us um, probably, probably before it hit uh, others, we saw it coming. Um, we started watching kind of last year and in January, we were pretty seriously ramping up. And so I thought uh, as, as uh, Mike and I spoke last week about how we might do this, I thought uh, maybe I would just talk about what we did and how, how the city at large has responded. And, um, and then there's, there's a few kind of easy takeaways of, of how to align what we've done with what you might be doing. And then, you know, Mike's obviously the expert in HR law and, and things like that. So I'll defer any opinion on that because, because our HR law is vastly different than any of y'all's. If you've ever done firefighter payroll, you it will make you appreciate how easy, um, because, because FLSA uh, 7K exemptions are no joke. Yeah. So with that, what the, the first thing we saw was, you know, obviously there's a virus on the spread and, and how are we going to protect our people? And, and so we had a fairly robust uh, backstock of PPE uh, going into it. Um, we had, for normal times, we had about a 10 year supply on hand. And, and that was, um, because we figured there would be a run on the supply chain if something happened, um, but we didn't ever factor in that a, a pandemic of, I don't think the scope of this uh, was in our initial planning. And so we have now uh, uh, taken our PPE levels five fold. And what we used to buy for a do about a dollar a mask, we're now paying $5 and 50 cents a mask. Um, so the good news is we are finally finding the supply chain to catch up. Um, and, and so some of the things that, that had pandemic pricing attached to them for the last six weeks are starting to creep back down. We, as a matter of fact, just got a confirmation of an order from one of our vendors um, back for pre-COVID pricing on N95 masks, and they're the good masks, not uh, pandemic uh, duck bills, what we call them. <laughs> fitted, uh, fit testable mass so it um, you know so it's like we can all kind of take a breath we're getting through this but the bad news is normal isn't normal probably for us until next summer we're suspecting that COVID calls um, continue for us until next summer and we're planning accordingly and so we're getting our guys out of N95 masks and, and just today we're putting them into Pappers, which are uh, pressurized air purifying respirators. So it's a battery pack that they wear on their, on the, their side hip. And, and we figured, and I bought those prior to supply chain catching up. So I could buy Pappers for the cost of 80 N95 masks. And when you're in it for the long haul until next summer, it made more sense to make the investment in something that's bulletproof rather than continuing to burn through N95 masks. So so that was the first thing we did is we got a hold of supply chain. The second thing, we found new and unique um, uh, ways to protect our people um, other than just the traditional gowns and, and uh, masks. And so I just talked about PAPRs and we have a plan that goes all the way up to wearing firefighting uh, SCBAs, self-contained breathing apparatus on medical calls should our supply chain run short. So uh, we tried to go about three to five levels deep in every plan that we had. Next was, uh, so that's inhalation and absorption through the face and mucus areas uh, that we were protecting. Next is skin. And, and what we find is this is not a very robust virus, um, but we didn't know what we didn't know at the time. So we planned out about five different ways to protect our guys through uh, absorption. And, 
So we have gowns, medical gowns that you see in, in the media. Then we have Tyvek suits, which look, kind of look a little hazmat-ish. Hazmat um, from there, then we're going to raincoats, which does not sound very sexy, but it's highly effective at keeping stuff off of your people. Um, then from there, we're going to a level B hazmat suit. So we're, we're multiple layers deep and, and the, our final PPE in every case is sustainable. So air packs are sustainable as long as we protect our air supply. So that caused us to come up with new uh, procedures for, to protect our compressor stations and, and who can go into that room and how they get well checked before they go in. So you can see the downline of each of these decisions causes 16 more decisions to take place. So fire has definitely taken a leading role for the city, but the city is in the the business of, of, of interacting with people as well. So we had to determine how does permits work? How, how does uh, Petopia, which we have, if you're in the market for a pet, we have hands down the best uh, animal control uh, department of any city in the area. And, and those, they do a wonderful job, but how do they interact with the public and, and how, how can we be more aligned with what the public's looking for when it comes to social distancing? And so we added acrylic dividers in our permits. We went to appointment only uh, for anything in City Hall. We require uh, uh, any, well, we closed most of our public buildings to all but essential employees, even, even uh, employees of the city that don't work in that building or aren't considered essential to the facility itself can't enter that facility. So every day to get into a facility, you got to go get your, your, temperature checked, go through a questionnaire and you get a dot and these colored dots enable you to go into different color, uh, different facilities across the city to get into a fire station. I mean, it, it pretty much you're going to have to have your pastor involved because that's a closed building and only the crew that works that day and they get wristbands and those wristbands coordinate with the ER. So the ERs know that we're doing our part and making sure we're, we're sending a healthy workforce their, their direction. So, uh, Next was cleaning. How do we clean uh, our stations and clean our apparatus? We're taking the sickest of the sick in our society into uh, essentially, uh, I always refer to it as a dumpster on wheels. I shouldn't, but it's, a, it's an ambulance, um, but it's about the size of a dumpster. And we're putting our people in there with them for five to 20 minutes on the way to a hospital. So how do I keep my people safe? And how do I get that box clean for the next customer? So um, there are some high dollar uh, cleaning agents um, all available on the market. And, and because we started in January, we were way up ahead of the curve. Um, we were able to buy some ultraviolet lights that kill virus uh, with saturation time. And we're using that in uh, uh, most of our uh, conference rooms and some of our offices. Every office gets wiped down twice a day. Um, you know, keyboards, cell phones, telephones, doorknobs um, at 8 a.m. and uh, 2 p.m. Then the, the offices uh, get wiped down. And everything gets cleaned. And those ambulances, we looked for um, some commercially available products that, that spray disinfectant. And we found one. It was $15,000, but it wasn't available until May. So right now, we've spent the fire department has spent about $72,000 on COVID response just out of our own and budget. And, and most of that is to keep our employees safe. Very little of that affects customer care. Um, but it was, it, it was a necessary uh, function to, uh, to ensure um, continuity of business for us. And so we'll get that first, um, it's, it's a, the name escapes me, but it essentially puts a charge to the, to the liquid that's coming out so it clings to things. And, and I sent that product to uh, one of our smartest guys and said, tell me what this thing does and what else will do it. And, and it turns out, he's like, well, it's kind of like a mosquito fogger with a charge at the end. And so we started using mosquito foggers. And I know that sounds incredibly like, man, these guys are just making stuff up. Um, but we didn't have the option to wait for the commercially available. We still don't have it in hand. Uh, we're expecting to have it within the week, um, but we ordered it like two and a half months ago. So from the mosquito fogger, we switched over to a cheap Harbor Freight spray gun. And so 
we put disinfectant in a spray gun and then paint the inside of our ambulance like you would a car and let it sit for seven minutes to, to kill whatever virus might be in there. And we spray computers, stretchers, undercarriages, auto loads, heart monitors, uh, auto pulses, which are kind of like CPR machines. We spray everything and then let it sit. It takes us 15 ounces of cleaner to, uh, to deep clean an ambulance. So we, we figured out right away that our, our one minute cleaner, which is called Cavicide, and it's $26 a gallon that we were gonna run into shortage of that. So we found a product called BCN uh, 15, I believe, uh, from a paper supply company. We looked at raw materials. And so that's kind of, as you are looking to go to start your business back up, your normal vendors might not be in business anymore, or they might not be starting up with the same frequency or in uh, a speed that you are. So you're gonna have to look for options uh, down your supply chain. and so. This product, uh, the other thing it had for us is it's non-alcohol based, it's water based. So we went from a one minute kill time uh, for 99% for of viruses to a five minute kill time. And so we just adopted a seven minute stand time. So we spray it, we'll have a fire truck go to the ER, spray everything in that ambulance, and then it sits for seven minutes. Then we wipe down the surfaces that matter and everything else sits there. And so our inside of our ambulances is very drab looking because it's been wet and dried, wet and dried. So when this, when we get through this, we'll, we'll go in there and shine them up again because we have some really nice ambulances. So, um, so that's like the cleaning the part of it. And then kind of where I wrap up our experiences, our business practice, we've had to drastically change our business practice where we were always looking for opportunities to do more and how can we best serve uh, the, the next caller of 911 or somebody that really doesn't even know they need the fire department, but we can inject either a fire or life safety training to them or, or just add value in general, that we've had to pull our guys back to, to limit their exposure to the public. We have a knock and back up policy now. So when somebody calls 911, we're asking a lot of questions and, we, we, and, and we're giving our guys as much heads up as we can when they get there as to whether we suspect COVID or not. And just to kind of put it in perspective, um, there are certain areas of our city that have more COVID than others. There's some areas that don't have any, but we're treating every patient as though they're COVID positive because it, um, I have to get to the end of this with a workforce. So it's better to, because we were so diligent in looking for PPE up front, I can afford to burn the PPE that keeps my workforce healthy. So that, you know, we have contingency plans that go down to 20% workforce. What's that look like? And that, that looks like, you know, we, we get to an ambulance call. When we get there, we supplement with other services and we do exterior firefighting, which is not what city of Sugarland's used to. So uh, the best thing that I could do for our fire department is keep a healthy workforce. And, and we've done that very effectively um, because our responders are taking it serious and using their, their uh, PPE appropriately. So if they, they go on a call, they'll knock, they back up six feet and they have a conversation at the door prior to going in. If they have to go into a building, a house or a facility, one person will go in in full PPE, the rest of the crew stays outside and will shuttle equipment to the door. Um, if they're going to a healthcare facility, which um, for us, we have 15 distinct addresses that equate to about 20% of our business in Sugarland. So um, those are healthcare facilities. And so we started, working those relationships uh, early February probably to ask them to do more for us to uh, to bring the patient to the door for us instead of us going to get them out of their bed or their room the facility staff brings them out to us and that looks rough to most people when they see us doing that patient care exchange under like the the carport of a nursing home um, but it helps us to keep our staff uh, clean and prolonged our PPE um, until we could get um, more on on hand. Um, in a residential setting, um, it's not uncommon for us to ask the homeowner to come out and sit on the stretcher in front of the house or get them loaded up into the ambulance and do our questioning there um, so that we don't have to go into a house and, and further expose our, our, our personnel. Um, there, there's certain things that we do in healthcare. Anything that, that produces an aerosol is the most dangerous thing for our responders right now. And so there's other... Um, other departments uh, across the nation. I mean, this is a worldwide problem. And so I'm, I'm sharing information, especially with most Texas fire departments. I'm in a group that we talk uh, almost daily now. 
Um, well, most fire departments across Texas have stopped doing nebulizer treatments, CPAPs, um, anything but RSI, which is rapid sequence intubation, and it's kind of dangerous for both the responder and, and the patient. Um, and, and so we've tried to find workarounds for that, including acrylic uh, patient care boxes where we uh, have the ability to put a patient into a box that that's then has negative pressure to pull the atmosphere out of that as long as we have them on an oxygen producing uh, device then then that keeps them healthy and and then most recently is the addition of these papers that I talked about so any kind of a workplace adopt, adoption that you can make um, really kind of work uh, work to your advantage um, when it comes to reports of exposure um, you know, we write everything up we're required by state law Texas administrative code to write up any uh, exposure or injury of a firefighter and it's not just a workers comp claim it goes to the Texas Commission on Fire Protection and depending on the injury then we have to self-report to the Texas Department of State Health Services so the compliance side of our industry is is, is pretty tough um, and so we had to adopt our adapt our reporting requirement uh, reporting strategies a little bit to make sure that we're compliant um, and then you, we use the CDC guidelines, but those change very often, especially for healthcare workers. So in, in your industry, you can use general CDC guidance, but make sure that just because you look at something on Monday, that the employee A had this happen, and you look at the CDC on Monday, employee B has the same thing happen on Thursday, go back to the CDC, because it changes that often uh, as to what's going on. Uh, quarantine guidelines. At first, we were quarantining firefighters for 14 days. We got um, uh, relationships with a couple of hotels, and we would just pay them per diem because that's the good thing is uh, Grubhub and, and all these order out services were still working. So we would take them a couple of solid meals, um, and they would supplement with, with their per diem money. So it made it kind of easy for us. Um, but we, we didn't have any, those were suspected COVID exposures as the CDC guidance changed, our need to quarantine people has greatly reduced and we haven't quarantined anybody in I guess about two and a half weeks now. So, um, and and we went to a zero tolerance PPE wear. So every interaction they have PPE on. So just know those CDC requirements when it comes to quarantine and then also the return to work. That changes and it's actually dictated by the county that you live or reside or, or live or work in. And, and so they adopt CDC, but it finally goes to the authority, the health authority. Um, so for Fort Bend County, it's Dr. Reynolds and we work with Dr. Reynolds um, weekly. And we have a city health authority, Dr. Ansel Dua. I talk to him three or four times a day, um, sometimes more. Um, and then I'll kind of close with what I, what I started up front is we think that this is kind of our normal until summer. We think that we'll get a little respite here uh, this summer, but there's, uh, uh, there's, there's enough COVID patients that uh, we're still gonna ride this, this wave. Um, and then hopefully it kicks back up in the fall and, and we see it, it slow down a little bit in, in the uh, next summer. Now, you know, there's, there's a lot of opinions on, is this the virus? Is this the super virus that we've, we've all been warned about? Or is this just another virus? Uh, you know, the, the numbers, so if, if you're in the crowd that you're panicking, it's not that hard to stay safe. Social distance, uh, you know, wash your hands, don't touch your face. That's a hard one for me. I found out that I touch my face often, especially my eyes, because I have allergies um, and, and the pollen gets me, but, um, you know, there's some good sources out there to uh, to remind you to how to stay safe and clean your workspaces and, and use good hygiene in your work area. Uh, this this doesn't have to be a death sentence for all of us. Uh, most people that get it get through it. Many many people that get it don't know that they even had it. So um, we 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 do see a, a trend um, not just in Fort Bend but in the state that it's a younger group that it has it the most, it's the 35 to 45, and it's kind of shifted here lately, 45 to 55, but the deaths um, are almost exclusively um, 60 or older with, uh, with uh, comorbidity factors. Um, so, you know, don't, don't let this consume you. Uh, it's, it's easier than not easy to control in the workplace. And with that, I will pass to the brains of the operation uh, 
and, and let Mike take over. Uh, Mike, do you mind if I ask, ask a question real quick? Um, the, uh, just just uh, real quick, how, you've mentioned how you guys are handling the outside. You're in your office now, um, and you guys uh, are, and you have your guys at stations. Uh, how are y'all handling literally just being at the station with one another, more so than, than, than the public? Are you are wearing masks with each other or are y'all disinfecting at the door? Like, what, what are you doing? Yeah, to get into the station, you have to prove that you're healthy enough to, to get in. And so we're doing uh, uh, temperature checks at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. at the station. Um, we're asking, we haven't mandated, there's some fire departments that have become very, very strict that you have to social distance in the station. You have to wear a mask anytime you're around a coworker. You can only have two people in any room, only two people can eat together, but they have to be on opposite ends of the table. I mean, they've gotten very, very strict. Um, we haven't because I didn't want to put our guys in the position to have to break a rule to just, I mean, they work 48 hours and that's a big, uh, you know, we, we need to be reasonable and responsible in our approach to this. We've given them every tool to stay clean. We've told them if, if they don't feel good, stay home. The city rewrote some policies where we'll allow employees to go 80 hours negative on sick leave. It's more important for us to, to not have them at work than it is to make sure our balances are even right now. We'll, we'll sort it out in the end. Um, but if you don't feel good, stay home. And, and it's a, we've made it our, our lieutenant's job to, to make sure that if somebody doesn't look well, contact HR and we'll send them home. We don't, we're not taking any chances so yeah, anytime they leave the station, we want them in masks. Um, any interaction with the public, they're wearing masks, uh, regardless of call type. Any, any EMS call, they're wearing N95 masks. Um, they're cleaning the stations, cleaning the fire truck, cleaning the ambulance on a very regular basis. And uh, you know, I have noticed a couple of stations have spread their chairs out a little bit. They're kind of doing it on their own. And I think that, that, that they're probably better than me going in there saying, you're gonna do this, this, and this, because when they can decide to do it, they own those results. And, and the proof's kind of in the pudding for us. Um, we actually have more people coming to work during this pandemic than we normally otherwise would. It's probably not because we're so dynamic and they want to work with us. It's just they can't travel anywhere, so nobody can take vacation. <laughs> and so we're actually kind of at a heightened risk of, of overcrowding because everybody's coming to work and it hadn't been our experience just yet. Um, we're, we're working really hard at that now. In admin, uh, we're not wearing masks, but um, when when we get together, uh, I mean, I haven't I haven't sat at the same table with anybody in a long time, other than my family at home. So um, usually, people come in, they sit about twelve feet from me over at the conference table. We have a conversation, and they leave. Uh, so you know, we're being responsible with it, you know, even in admin. Gotcha. Sorry about that, Mike. I just wanted to. No, uh, no, yeah. you're cool. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Yes, absolutely. All right, Doug, great job and, and sincerely honored to, to partner with you on this. I'm gonna shift gears as we talked about earlier and kind of talk a little bit more from the human resource perspective as if, if businesses start to reopen or they've been open and they're adding a little bit more of the non-essential workers. The one thing I wanna mention on uh, preparing for a safe work environment, and this has come up a lot here recently, and I think I heard Doug mention some policy development for our, for our businesses out there, as you add specific policies to COVID-19, things like that, make sure you update your IIPP plan. That's your Injury Illness Prevention Program or basically a safety manual. So make sure anything you're developing, you get that into there. When you consider those type of plans, obviously an overall safety manual of sorts or IIPP for Manufacturing and construction may have different considerations overall than an office environment, but just because you're in an office environment, there's still OSHA guidelines and safe practices, ergonomics, all different things. So make that your placeholders, you update policies, don't have them spread out, bring them into that document as a placeholder. I will mention uh, among CDC guidelines, a great OSHA publication is publication 3990. And it's a, it's a very robust pandemic type uh, document preparing workplace for COVID-19. So as you're looking at some of these things that Doug mentioned and other practices, be sure to look at that document. And uh, that is very, very important uh, resource. 
I want to move into kind of our third bullet here. Are you workforce ready? So as I mentioned, various businesses out there have either been shut down, they're reopening, they're bringing furloughed workers back, they've been essential, uh, but maybe not everybody's been there. So there's really three things I want to talk about. Planning and communication, which is key, I think we would all agree. Touch a little bit more on workplace safety and some HR kind of policies and employment labor law considerations. And then leave of absence. There's some potential uh, legal backgrounds of this down the road. I want to make sure that we're all aware of. So with regards to planning and communication, uh, first and foremost, I think we see this as the governor's spoken this week and so forth in the different phases of openings. Um, follow those federal, state, and local guidelines as to the ability to reopen and all the rules around that. The other thing I wanted to mention on the side that we've had some great sessions on the Triple P, the payroll protection, uh, so forth, and uh, make sure to, to maintain, if you've gotten that loan and you have certain criteria to maintain your level of workforce, your wages, among other things, make sure you're restoring employment uh, to folks uh, and, you're, and you're meeting the requirements of that Triple P loan, okay? As far as your planning and communication, there are a few things you wanna consider. Uh, first and foremost, uh, determine who should return first. And so again, I've had essential businesses, non-essential businesses, people working remote, but they're open. So the question number one would be, who, what are the essential functions and, and who are those essential employees that really, as we start to reopen, they're the first ones you're really getting in back in. With that, uh, consider a phased ramp up. And, and what that simply means is what it probably implies is you don't have to flip the switch and everybody comes back tomorrow. You, you identify your essential employees. If there's some that can still work, telework and so forth, slowly ramp that up. And uh, I think, you know, Doug mentioned without vacations, everybody's here more, more so than normal. Uh, and that's fine, that's great. They're serving us, we're happy to hear that. Uh, but as a, other businesses, you may have the opportunity to kind of to ramp that up. Um, the idea of telework, I've had several conversations with businesses and organizations of all sorts. And uh, I think a lot of organizations have had to jump to telework very quickly, adapt technology. Uh, just like I was asking Kevin lots of questions and, and Glenn Smith who's spoken several times, it's just, it, it's a new era. But I truly feel that the idea of teleworking is not gonna go away. And I think employers are gonna find out that people can be productive. And the truth of it is I had a comment made to me uh, by a group, they said, Mike, when we return, I don't know if we need all this square footage, that's a fixed cost. And when things become lean, can I productively have a workforce that can telework and maybe come together often either through virtual meetings or in person? But that's something to think about. And also think about that next generation of talent that is here now, the millennials, the, the Gen Z, your, your workplace design is attractive to them on the back side of this too. So, so consider how that can still play a role. This is very important to me from a legal standpoint Remind decision makers, when decision makers in your organization are deciding who should come back and when, make sure it's based on non-discriminatory uh, criteria. And, and I find that most people aren't necessarily intentionally going that direction, but it's similar to a furlough or layoff. Well, why me and not somebody else? And make sure you have solid criteria as you're determining why someone's coming back to work quicker than the other person, because they do have essential functions. And with that, it's ever important to remind your employees of your discrimination and harassment type policies. But in this case, discrimination, which is a little different than harassment. It's around terms and conditions of employment. You wanna make sure as and in any organization and 15 or more employees, you're a covered employer. Doesn't mean if you're less, you don't wanna be fair and equitable, but we do have a policy that prohibits it. We have a complaint procedure uh, and there's no retaliation. So very, very important as decisions are being made we want to make sure that we do things in good faith, which is always the intention, but not accidentally trip up and not fail to remind our employees, let me know if I've missed something. We're trying to do things the right way. With that, and I'm going to talk more about this, but there's a new kind of a term or a term resurfacing about vulnerable persons. And those are the people that are at high risk. And I'm going to circle back and share with you some insight as to where unintentionally there could be a tremendous rise in discrimination claims based on this. So with that, I wanna talk a little bit more under planning communication 
and prepare communication to for, for employees returning to work. Okay, either everybody's returning, or again, we've been somewhat open. Um, you know, number one is establishing a return to work timeline. And consider, you know, it's one thing to say, we're going to open up Monday, you need to be here, and that's all there is to it. I encourage organizations of all sorts, you know, nonprofit, you know, everybody, have a grace period. People feel uncomfortable. They have different lenses, listen, different perspectives. They're working through uncertainty. You know, th there's some there are timelines to this, but th give them a grace period. And I think that's very important. Number two, which I think most of anybody here uh, would, would also probably share the same idea with us, is to establish good open communication and employee engagement. That is so important, practices of employee engagement. And, and so with that, uh, identify and explain uh, the steps being taken to ensure safety. You know, that's gonna put people at ease. Uh, when you're engaging people, they may say, Thank you for letting me have a voice in this and not being a one-sided conversation. Here's something I was thinking about. Maybe we missed something. Our employees are a valuable source of information to help guide us and, and collectively work as a team to make sure we're safe. Remember that to me, this is change management. The pieces have moved around tremendously in our world. And so change management basics, you know, for any person, it's, hey, what is change and why is it changing? What's it mean to me? And so as you reintroduce folks into the workplace, it's important to maintain the principles of good change management, which are open communication. Um, I think with that, you know, one of the things is actively seeking out concerns and uh, being proactive. Uh, you want to be careful. There's a thin line between inviting too much personal information, um, but actively individual basis. You know, Kevin, Doug, how are you guys doing? Is there anything on your mind? Anything we can think about? Don't wait for it to come to you, okay? And, and you know, that's going to help us because we've got to anticipate a level of anxiety in any organization. There's going to be rumors or mis misinformation. I, I've dealt with it with a lot of clients that someone has spread, a, a, maybe not with bad intention, but a rumor that says so-and-so has COVID-19 and this, that, and it's gotten out of control. And so we want to manage that by being proactive. And with that, there's two last points. Leadership, uh, as always, should be visible. That's part of engagement. And then also organizations are identifying that key person. Sometimes it's the HR person, the safety person. But who's that single point of contact that's working with leadership that employees know this is where I go to have that conversation? So it very well may be human resources. Um, it could be, you know, somebody that supplementing your organization providing consulting on that could be that neutral third party, uh, or it could be someone else in a smaller organization. So those are some of the things I'm planning in communication. I want to shift gears a little bit here and talk a little bit further about workplace safety. I think Doug shared some tremendous things that our, our department and, and uh, within Sugarland and so forth, EMT, everybody's doing. I mean, I have a, another hospital district north of, uh, of the Houston area, and I can imagine, you know, the ambulances and those confined areas and all the things that are, that are being done. So that, that's a tremendous job we're doing in that scenario. First and foremost, as an organization for workplace safety, it's exactly what Doug said. Look at your CDC standards, and to his point, you're exactly right. You can go out to the DOL, Department of Labor Q&A, IRS Q&A on the paid sick leave, EOC guidance on disability, what you can ask as far as uh, medical questions, which were always a no-no, uh, temperature checks, and those things are changing daily, every day. So I, I've gotten in the practice, uh, you know, I've shared a lot, of, there's a lot of information to sift through but those are some good resources. And maybe you start the day where you have some undivided uh, focus and, and you can really kind of update yourself on a few of those things, okay? With that, I think you'll find some guidance that we've all seen um, and good practices. Again, Doug mentioned a couple of it. Implement social distancing to the best of your ability, okay? And so there, there's a few things there. Uh, with that, staggered shifts. I've talked to a client that says, as we reintroduce people, I may have a mix of telework and in office. They may come in some on Tuesday and Thursday, others on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. 
They may work some longer hours, have a few other days off. There's a lot of different ways to make sure, as Doug mentioned, you know, not everybody's in that box of sorts uh, at the same time. And so that's important um, as well as making sure. And of course, in, in Texas, uh, you don't have to require breaks in certain, in the public sector at least, um, or in the private sector rather. Um, but if you do offer those, and particularly in manufacturing settings where things are a little bit more regimented, you know, you, you can offset those breaks. So not everybody's going right at the same time, okay? Another thing that's been a, a great advice, I believe, has been limit in-person meetings. Uh, certainly virtual meetings. I was talking to my older sister-in-law uh, over the weekend. She works for one of the large hospital districts in, in, in fundraising. Um, but she said, you know, we're, we're going back to work, but my understanding is we're going to be in our office doing Zoom meetings, not in the conference room. And so I think there's still going to be that. And there's going to be the, the desire for people to reconnect and be together, but we've got to be diligent. We, we certainly don't want to add to another wave and, uh, and heighten that. Uh, a lot of recommendations have been around uh, closing off gathering areas like kitchens, taking chairs out. It's not that we don't want people to be able to take a break and eat and so forth, um, you know, but maybe we don't do that necessarily as, as a group. Maybe we do that in our office. And the one thing I'll plant a seed on on that, and we'll talk about another wage and hour consideration, keep in mind your non-exempt employees, the ones that are eligible for overtime, that's your, your rank and file, the majority of them. Um, in order to dock for a meal break, it has to be a 30 minute meal break, which you're completely relieved of duties. The Department of Labor and Wage and Hour sometimes said, well, Kevin, if you're eating at your desk, what's the chances are you're gonna answer an email or, or answer the phone? So I don't wanna overcomplicate it. Just remember, non-exempt, if you're eating at your desk, are you still doing some sort of work and do I need to pay for that lunch break? Just be mindful of that. Um, obviously sanitation. I think that's gonna put everybody's mind at ease to communicate what we're doing. Doug mentioned a lot of the different ways we're able to disinfect and so forth. Some are costly. And, uh, and, and hard to find the, the equipment and so forth. So we want to be uh, thoughtful to that. And I think most people have been. Uh, another of a couple last ones are PPE needs. So as, as Doug was mentioned, you know, public interaction, every business is different. What extent of public interaction restaurants where they, they start to open 25% phase one, you know, there's interaction there, curbside, a lot of different things. And so I think what you'll find, particularly in that OSHA publication I mentioned, there's the high, mid, and low level risk. But PPE, is it mandatory uh, or is it optional? Okay, be clear on that communication and expectations. We have a responsibility as employers to make sure it's not a known hazard in the workplace. And a lot of times we don't know. Uh, we can take temperatures, we can ask questions, a lot of things. People may be asymptomatic as Doug mentioned. And so, you know, ju just be clear what your expectations are. Um, one of the things I found, and I think Doug hit on it as far as I come into the location, I answer questions, I, I get the, the sticker or what have you. Um, another thing I've seen, which is very similar, I think it's probably exactly what you mentioned, Doug, is uh, an employee visitor COVID-19 self-decoration form. Um, that when I come in as an employee in the morning, I come in as a, a visitor, it's a simple form I fill out that says, hey, if I had any symptoms, uh, have I been traveling, I test I've not. That's risk mitigation. Because if a visitor coming in does test positive COVID-19, have you done the appropriate steps prior to that to say, hey, I asked the questions, they signed off, I'm doing the amount of diligence I can to, to screen people of sorts. Two last things I wanna move on to leave of absence and accommodation. One of which is, the idea of doing temperature checks and asking medical questions was a no-no. Every human resource person, most business owners knew under disability laws, and they apply to 15 or more, but still the right practice, uh, that you can't necessarily ask medical questions. Uh, the EOC has come out in which disability laws fall under the, the uh, jurisdiction of to say, yes, you can check some, uh, temperatures. Uh, you, can, you can ask about symptoms. Uh, I'd be careful about asking about underlying medical issues, which are more private. But if you are doing temperatures, you know, number one, have somebody that's trained on the equipment, have a one person doing it, and maintain confidentiality. The questions come up that if we have somebody that has tested positive COVID-19 or been around a family member, for example, 
what do I tell fellow employees? It is not the first uh, off the line to say, well, Kevin, your coworker had COVID-19. If you don't need to mention his name and you can just say we had a coworker that worked within the, the area of 10 other workers, we want to maintain a level of confidentiality to the point uh, where we're unable to, and we have to disclose something a little bit more specific, but be careful on that balance. And then the last thing I'll say on temperature checks, and we'll move on to leave of absence, as I mentioned, compensability, just like with the lunch breaks, there has been a lot of talk to, if I come in in the morning and I have to get in a line and hopefully I'm staying a six part uh, apart, you know, social distancing to get my temperature checked, it's just like the idea under wage and hour laws that I have to get to work, spend 30 minutes putting on PPE before I actually get to the, my workstation. Is that compensable? And that's been the source of a lot of class action lawsuits in the past. What most states are doing, and it's really kind of come back to the states primarily and federal law, is if I have to stand in line for a temperature check as an employee, if it's de minimis, which is a subjective term, but two, three minutes, five minutes or less, I'm waiting to get in line, check my temperature before I go clock in of sorts, and eh, maybe not compensable. Now, states like California, uh, which are a little bit different kind of environment, have jumped and said it's all compensable. So what I'm saying to you primarily, we're all probably gonna be in Texas on this one. If it's de minimis, probably not, but if you go more than five minutes, consider playing it safe. You don't wanna risk wage and hour laws. And so some things to consider on that. And, um, as I've mentioned to many people earlier, um, you can get my information through the chamber. I answer any questions with no obligation. It, it's just the way to, to get back to our community. So the last thing I want to talk about a little bit here as we kind of close out on time of leave of absence and, and accommodations. And so there's two things I want to mention. Keep in mind that the earlier things as we were into the latter part of March, the big thing was the Family First Act and paid sick leave if you need shelter in place or if you're, you're asked to self quarantine or expanded FMLA if your child, your son or daughter is uh, situated where their child care or their, day or their school is closed down. Those things are still in play to the end of the year. And as Doug mentioned, you know, th this could continue going on. So please don't lose sight of those. Um, and, and please reach out as you have questions uh, in kind of determining those. The one thing I've put in place with clients, which is very important, I think a lot of people have done it, is if I say I'm seeking paid sick leave because of, uh, I've been asked to quarantine, then it, it's almost like a request form that says, I'm checking off that this is the reason I'm requesting paid sick leave. There's a couple of questions about if you're caring for a child, uh, if they're older than 17, do they, are they incapable of self-care? If they're 14 to 17, how come they can't take care of themselves? But most importantly is this, you have an employee requesting that leave, you're paying it, and then you're gonna seek reimbursement to, from the IRS uh, through, through your, your 941, your payroll taxes. And so when that employee signs off on that form that they attest this is true information, and you may or may not be able to get a doctor's note depending on how busy everything is, that's going to give you a layer of protection as an employer to say, I acted in good faith. I provided this paid leave. The employee attested that this is honest and truthful and provided whatever documentation. The other thing, and a couple uh, closing comments, I mentioned, uh, I think, a reasonable accommodation. And again, that falls under your disability laws. The American with Disability Act Amendments Act. Amendments Act, it was updated in 2008 and drastically changed some definitions of disability and how you consider it. But consider this, if we have, if we're reopening and we have an individual that's per CDC and otherwise known to be at high risk, age uh, or underlying health issues, we need to be careful. We're opening back up and if they say, look, I've got some concerns you know, they don't necessarily have to reveal the private health information, but they probably would in this situation to say, I'm concerned I'm older, I'm concerned this, that, or the other. Be careful, that may be a leave consideration under disability laws in which you would want to afford and you would want to, first and foremost, very critical to the disability process is to engage in dialogue. Don't just say no to something, try to work in good faith. What you may think is reasonable or they may think it's reasonable and you say, nah, it's an undue hardship. Law may not support you on that. 
So that's a topic in itself. The other thing I'll mention there is, I had this question come up from a client yesterday, which I think was incredibly wise. You know, should I, it started with the, the suggestion that if someone's 65 or older, since they're, they could be high risk, should, should, should I not, you know, call them back right away? Well, don't assume that because we have had younger individuals in the general population that have gotten ill. So ask, ask your employees that may be high risk uh, age or, or if, if you know they have health issues, that do you feel comfortable coming back? And if they say, yes, I wanna come back and you prohibit that just because on your assumption of the protected class, uh, that could be very, very uh, much a, a reverse discrimination consideration. And so that's where we're kind of looking for and a lot of the, the big law firms, for example, have had you know national uh, webinars and stuff. A lot of them are anticipating towards the end of the year, you're gonna see a spike in discrimination uh, uh, claims based on vulnerable persons. And, and vulnerable person by definition, uh, not under the EOC, but I believe under OSHA is higher in age and uh, underlying health conditions. So just be very, very careful with that. I wanna uh, mention one last question and then we'll kind of open it up. We don't have a lot of time left for Q&A. And obviously, I'm sure Doug's the same. If someone wants to reach out within reason, we're happy to help. But this question came up and said, Mike, what, what happens if I work with people through telework, I do this, that, and the other, and someone at the end of the day just says, you know, Kevin, I just don't feel coming, comfortable coming back to work. I, I just, I'm, I can't do it. At what point do you make an employment decision? And my advice is to show you've acted in good faith clearly understand their concerns, get them to put those in writing so they're locked in, it doesn't change. And they could have new concerns, but put in writing what your concerns are so I can clearly understand those and we can work off of those. Let me see what I can do to work within reason. And that's the spirit of your disability laws. Are you working within reason to try to accommodate? But at the end of the day, it may come down to somebody just saying, look, you know, I don't feel comfortable. We articulate in writing that we've taken these steps. We've not had any known hazards per se. We don't have a known case. Uh, we're not risky here. Your, your job doesn't allow you to tell work. And we're kind of at the end of the road and we value you, but we also understand your safety is a concern. If you don't feel comfortable coming back, then, then we need to come to an agreement. And so we're coming to a close. I want to end it there. And, and uh, thank you very much for adding to Doug's wonderful uh, 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 content. Mike, Mike and Doug, uh, we both, uh, everyone appreciate it. I'm getting comments. Uh, um, uh, Carrie just mentioned uh, that she appreciates the valuable information uh, from, from both of you. Ironically, I think uh, the USA Today knew that we were doing this session because their top headline on their uh, uh, website is who's liable if workers get sick as the economy reopens. Uh, and so the article goes on to say uh, it, it's a it's a kind of a tough question, uh, yeah. basically. And so um, uh, I know you guys are not, uh, and Mike, I know you're not an attorney, but you play one on TV. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, um, but there is a concern that, hey, you know, from a risk management standpoint and, and, and even implementing some of the risks that both you and Doug talk about, it, if, if I, if, if an employee comes back and they are sick, but they're asymptomatic or they are sick, but they didn't start feeling sick until they got to work. Am I then liable for, uh, you know, people that they came in in contact with? I've actually had business owner friends of mine worry about the same thing. So I just want to give you a second to possibly either speak to that or say, Hey, you need to talk to your attorney or, or yeah. whatever the case. Well, I, I'll first and foremost, I'll always pay great respect to counsel. Um, 28 going on 29 years. I know how to tie my shoes a little bit, but I always check with counsel uh, to check the math. And I think that's a great resource in our community. I will say this, there's two things of liability. It's, it's the failure to accommodate that we mentioned. And then there's the hazard duty clause under OSHA. And so if you're telling people, Kevin, Doug, you have to come back here uh, and, and you have some reason to believe there's a known hazard you're introducing them to, um, you've had somebody test positive and you've sanitized, but you didn't provide PPE. A absolutely. Someone could scrutinize you and say, first and foremost, and this is a big question under, under OSHA, did I get COVID-19 at work? And, and that's going to be contact tracing, all different things, you know, but it could go either way. And if you, they did, 
and you force them to come back unreasonably, didn't have proper PPE, didn't communicate your, your, your plans, you didn't update your safety policies, there's gonna be a lot of things that are scrutinized to say, did you do everything in good faith to protect this person or did you somewhat intentionally or unintentionally uh, reintroduce them or introduce them to a known hazard in the workplace? And that's where it's gonna fall under that hazard duty clause. And Doug may have some more comments. I, I agree with what he with what Mike's saying uh, wholeheartedly. And, and, and the weird thing about this situation is like for us, there are, do, uh, there's, there's ready-made guidelines for us to follow, even though they're changing, they're update, they're updated by the authority uh, of the national of, of federal government. And, and so what's left up to, in our case, the authority having jurisdiction, um, there, there's not a lot of interpretation where it's going to be different for, you know, uh, a pottery shop or, or uh, a retailer on what's, what's normal. So I would just suggest, and what we're doing is one, we're communicating what we're doing. We're trying to meet every standard that there is, and then we're, we're meeting best practice. And, and I think that that, what it does for us is, I mean, at the end of the day, if one of our guys gets COVID, it's a big dang deal to us and, and we don't want it to happen. Uh, we'll worry about the liability of it later, but we're already recognizing the goodwill of our employees when they look at their friends that work for other fire departments that, that don't have five layers of protection, that don't have deep cleaning of their apparatus, that don't have uh, the communications plan. Um, our employees appreciate that. Furthermore, we're getting feedback from our customers that they feel as though we're taking good care of them. And, and so I think in retail, it's gonna, you know, you've gotta be tuned into what your customers are looking for. They're, they won't come to your shop if they don't feel like uh, you're taking their health and safety serious. So much of this is done to keep a healthy workforce. Some of it's done just so psychologically they know that I give a darn about them. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Excellent so comments. So just to let y'all know, I was scrolling through the article as you guys were talking and y'all both hit on exactly what uh, one of the paragraphs says. We basically said OSHA requires employers to establish a workplace that is, quote, free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to employees. So they're basically saying OSHA to, to follow the CDC guidelines uh, to kind of protect yourself uh, as an employer uh, as well. So exactly what you guys were, uh, were talking about. We have a question from... Uh, from Facebook Live, and that question was resource for the sample self-declaration form that you talked about. Yeah, and, and I did reference that. Now, what's the question? I'm sorry, uh, yeah, my internet. Uh, self-declaration form, are there any resources for an sample self-declaration form? Yeah, uh, uh, anybody can email me. Um, let, let me give you my email, it's a little bit long, and it, it's without obligation. I, I'm very much just like the chamber here and, and Doug to support our community. It is M. Dobert, D-O-B-E-R-T, at H-R-I-N alignment, H-R-N alignment.com. And my mobile number is 281-889-9075. And uh, I've got some good checklists in that form. I'm, I'm going to be sending them out to clients and I, I am more than happy to, to share anything. So for those of you that are on the app, I just put that uh, in the chat as well. Uh, Mike's uh, email address and cell phone number. Uh, and what's your blood type, Mike? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, free from COVID. That's your. That's your. Yeah, that was about to. Say. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so uh, Rick Connolly wanted to let you guys know. Great webinar. Thanks for being there for us, Doug and Mike. Thanks for the chamber putting this together. Leadership class of 2014. The new. The new standard. What so, was that? 2013. 14, 14, 14, <laughs> 14 so. Well, we yeah. thank Rick, he's been a great leader in our community, continues to be, so thank you, Rick. Yes, yes, um, and so um, as we come to a close here, I just wanted to capture, um, uh, Juliet had a, just a couple quick questions. Uh, should employers continue to restrict work-related travel? Yes, yes, I apologize. I didn't mean to hit on that. Yeah. I, I think unless it's essential, it is what it is. And, and so 
I think minimizing travel and certainly minimizing requirement of it is very important. And uh, so that's a very good question. Okay. Um, and uh, and I apologize, guys. I spelled the alignment wrong. I, I switched the in and the e, so I'll retype it. Thank you, Carrie, for catching catching that. Um, I was going too fast. Uh, can an employee refuse to return to work due to fear of contracting the virus? Um, I, I'll answer it, Doug. I don't want to jump in in any way, um, but an employee, you know, they they can say I refuse to to return. I think that's where the dialogue comes into play. Because at some point as a business, if you say, I need my team here, even if you can tell telework, we collaborate better, we're here. But what I encourage, again, is to have dialogue. Say, well, tell me what your concerns are. Matter of fact, could you just shoot those to me in an email uh, so, so I'm clear on them? And work through a dialogue process. And it may get down to the point, again, where you say, we may agree to disagree, but we're doing these steps to sanitize. As Doug mentioned, following CDC guidelines, we don't have known uh, uh, hazards here and so forth like that. And, and so at some point we may kind of come to the point of saying, if, if you want to work, uh, you need to be back. And if you don't, that's fine. But documentation and that dialogue process of not just saying no, but back and forth is so, so important if you need to defend yourself. Uh, yeah, for us, uh, uh, relationship uh, starts way early in the employee uh, relationship where, where we designate everyone that works for most employees of the city, but everybody in the fire department is an essential employee. Mm -hmm. And it gives us the teeth to, uh, you know, that we're meeting standards. We're, we're, we, we're taking this serious. We're meeting best standards, uh, best, uh, best practices. But at the end of the day, if they refuse, it becomes job abandonment. As long as we can demonstrate that we've uh, given reasonable accommodation, now, even even with the fire, uh, with with our organization, we we have had uh, people ask for accommodations, and and what's reasonable today might not have been reasonable 60 days ago. So yep. we're we're taking uh, we're using a very broad brush when when we we decide what is is reasonable, um, because we want to do right by our employees, and we want everybody to get through this and and. I mean, we work too hard to get our employees. We don't want to run them off because of some yeah. virus. Uh, those are excellent points. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then final quick question is, when I recall an employee, do they need to fill out uh, new hire paperwork again? Okay. So, and I apologize, I'll take this one. There, there's two different things. If, if I'm recalling what I think of as a furlough, okay, you're still on the team, you're on the sideline, you're still an employee. So technically you don't have to rehire them and go through all those steps and so forth. What I do recommend if you put someone on furlough, there's two things. Um, give them a bona fide offer letter. You know, you call them and say, hey, we need you back. I've had a lot of clients say people may get comfortable not want to come back right now. Maybe they're getting benefits. So a bona fide offer letter, which is just very simple. The furlough's ended. We want you back. This, that, and the other. If they refuse to do that, a lot of the state unemployment offices are requiring you to notify the state and they sometimes have an application to say, hey, I know someone I filed unemployment, I've offered them a job back and they've said they're not coming back. Let the unemployment office kind of deal with that. So I, I think that's important to, to consider those two things. So I'll end with this. This is from the non HR person and non fire department. One of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten from an attorney uh, is to document, 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 because a lot of times in, uh, when, when there's an issue that comes up in court, it's not about who's right or wrong, it's who has the best documentation. So that goes along with what, what, you're, uh, what you're talking about. So uh, guys, this has been uh, great. I've learned a lot uh, from both of you. I appreciate uh, Doug and all the safety precautions uh, that you guys are doing, and I'm sure your counterparts are doing in, in Fort Bend uh, to keep us safe in the fact that you're out there first. We're doing a lot more than Larry, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so with, honest. With, with, with that being said, you are now the number one fire chief that I know uh, 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 in the Fort Bend area. <laughs> in the Fort Bend area, and I will let him know that. Trust me, uh, uh, I will let him know that. Uh, but uh, really appreciative uh, for uh, both of you guys, Doug, for you guys going out there and being the first to call because I know you're seeing this every uh, every day, and then Mike. Um, you know, your knowledge of HR is just uh, awesome. It's uh, just OSHA to DO, just all the acronyms 
uh, uh, as far as you know who you're uh, dealing with. Uh, and then uh, Juliet, um, uh, you're there. You're, she's going to announce, guys, we have upcoming events. And so I brought Juliet on to kind of announce what we have coming up here over the next week or so. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And to echo Kevin, Mike, and Doug, thank you so much for your expertise and your time today. We really do appreciate that. The Chamber is bringing you these webinars every Tuesday and Thursday from 12 to 1. And this Thursday, the 30th, we have two representatives from Whitley Penn who will be discussing changes to the tax laws and how that will affect your business. On next Tuesday, May 5th, we will have an update from City of Sugarlands Mayor Joe Zimmerman. And on Thursday, we will hear from City of Richmond's Mayor Evelyn Moore on updates from what City of Richmond is doing and how they're um, managing through this crisis. But thank you all so, so much for joining us today. We really do appreciate you tuning in. And we thank the Chamber for all you're doing. Thank you both, everybody there very much. Thank you guys. And so uh, for those of you um, that want to go back and uh, possibly listen or take uh, some additional notes, just note that every seminar that we are doing, uh, we are putting uh, under the, uh, at the Chamber's website, uh, under the Business and Professional tab. So if you go to the Business and Professional tab, you'll be able to, within 24 to 48 hours, uh, look at this uh, video again and uh, capture any other details that you want as far as the information. And again, feel free to reach out uh, to uh, to our panelists, uh, specifically Mike uh, at mdobert at hrinalignment.com, uh, mdobert at hrinalignment.com. Uh, Guys, thank you all so much, and that uh, will end our session for today. Thanks, Kevin. Good to be Thanks, here. Thanks, Doug. Right. Thanks to my favorite uh, fire chief and Fort Bend, too. Doug. There we go. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure Larry knows that. Yes, uh, please do. Uh, <laughs> Talk to you later. Bye, guys. Bye.